Happy to be here. Say, yeah, buddy. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was working part-time at UPS. The way UPS works is you have to work part-time uh, and load trucks and do things like that anywhere from 5 to 15 years before you go full-time. And so I was married. We didn't have any kids, but uh, I looked for something to do uh, so I could get another part-time job besides UPS and uh, thought, well, I like working out. You know, I worked for a gym at one point, and so I think I'm going to be a personal trainer. Seems kind of flexible and uh, uh, may work out for me. It's something I love. It's one of those things, if I'm being honest with you, I thought I would love it. It's a nice hobby to have, but working and doing it, I didn't like it that much. And the reason was, was because I quickly found out that personal training people wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't taking athletes and uh, having them go to the next level. It wasn't even taking people that were out of shape and really pushing them to get better because what most people looked for in a personal trainer was someone that was going to stand next to them while they walked on the treadmill for two miles an hour for an, for an hour. You know what I'm saying? Anybody know what I'm talking about? But that's not how I rolled as a personal trainer. See, what I did as a personal trainer was I pushed people. I made them do hard stuff. I made them do the stuff that they didn't want to do. And what I quickly learned was about half my clients bailed on me because they were looking for somebody just to stand next to them on the treadmill. But the other half that stuck with me got some incredible results. I remember one guy named John lost like 80 pounds in six months. And he looked like he could be on the cover of like a men's health magazine. And at the beginning, he hated my guts. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Say amen. Okay, so, so here's the deal today, as we're in week two of this series, Jesus Is. I'm not your motivational speaker today, I'm your personal trainer. Sometimes pastors have to be personal trainers. And so I'm here today to pump you up, so to speak, not allow you to go live in a van down by the river. Does that make sense? But I know what I'm talking about here, okay, so I want to welcome you if you're joining us online. Uh, we are in week two of a series called Jesus Is, and uh, what we're doing is we are kind of getting back to the basics at the beginning of the year and really the entire year, but really specifically at the beginning, we're, we're talking about who Jesus is, who was he? There's a lot of talk out there, there's a lot of opinions about who he is. We're basing this entire series off 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, listen to what it says in verses 1 and 2. This is the message version, and I just love it. It says, uh, you'll remember, this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. Just a reminder, if you're at Rev Church joining us online and you're looking for some polished speech here, that ain't going to happen. Amen, Rev Church? Like, my name's Josh, I know who I am, and that's not what you're going to get. He says, I deliberately, the context suggests that Paul had to actually work at what he's getting ready to say. I deliberately, I had to work at this. It was, wasn't easy to do this, but I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. Last week, we talked about Jesus, the good shepherd. Incredible week. I, I, I prayed with somewhere around 50 to 100 people. I don't want to preacher count it, but it was somewhere in there. And I'm going to do the same at the end of services today. Whoever needs prayer, I'm going to be available. Uh, God really ministered to people last week. This week, we're going to talk about Jesus is the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus made his first I am statement. There's several of them. I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am uh, the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. This was the very first I am statement that Jesus made in John chapter 6 when he declared, I am the, notice singular context, not a, okay, he's not a bread of life. It's not Jesus or Muhammad or Jesus or this or that. He says, I am exclusively the bread of life. Now, this sermon, I am going to have some fun, even though we're going to be going through a personal training session, because I get to talk about food. How many of y'all, 
Come on, baby. Come on. We, 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 hey, our word this year is revival. Let's have revival. How many of y'all like bread? Raise your hand. You like bread. Bread, yes, bread is incredible, you know. In Jesus' context, he's talking about like pita bread or whole wheat bread. And, and that's okay. We'll take that if that's all that's left in the basket at the restaurant, right? But I'm talking about even further than that. I, I remember uh, one of the reasons we loved moving to Crossville is because sometimes you roll past flowers and the smell. Amen, y'all? I mean, you're trying to go low carb and you're like, Satan, get behind me, Right? How about uh, cheddar cheese biscuits from Red Lobster? Raise your hand. Mmm, 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 mmm. That'll make you slap your mama for not feeding it to you before. Amen? Good, good stuff. How about Cracker Barrel biscuits and gravy? Raise your hand. We love some bread. We're going, man, we are going to have revival, man. Uh, how about some Cinnabon? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's bread? Amen? Cin how about... Annie Ann's cinnamon pretzels. Amen? You drive all the way to Knoxville for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, that's, that's bread. Like, that's incredible, incredible stuff. Uh, donuts. Can I get a witness, y'all? That's bread, man. That is bread. That's bread. Jesus was on to something here, wasn't he? Amen? Like, we're, we're down with this. Uh, how about, I, I know they're made out of corn, but I count it as bread, uh, tortilla chips. You know what I mean? You roll down to Romo's, you know, you go to Chewy's over in Knoxville, you get some tortilla chips. Or how about this? I even count this. This is one of my favorite breads. Um, how about this right here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm, mm. My uncle just passed away that worked for Little Debbie. He used to hook us up with stuff. But bread, amen? Is this bread, y'all? Does this qualify as bread? I mean... I think we need to tear it up. Jesus says it right here, like we need some bread in our life. I did some research and, and uh, studied bread. It is a $49 billion industry in the United States. We like us some bread. I typed in Jesus, the bread of life, and I want to show you a couple of things that popped up. For $25 on Amazon, you can actually get what is called, I think I've got a picture of it right here, the Jesus toaster that will toast your toast into the image of Jesus. And if you want to go real hardcore for 50 bucks, you can get what is called uh, the grilled Jesus sandwich maker, which is right here that makes a grilled cheese sandwich with Jesus on it. And that's great and that's awesome and everything, but Jesus wasn't talking about that kind of bread. Jesus was going a little deeper. Let me explain the context of John chapter 6 to you and tell you about a couple of things that had happened before Jesus makes this statement. And really, the context in which he's making this statement, let me give you the backstory on it. In John chapter 6 at the beginning, in verses 1 through 15, it's the story that even if you're not a church person, you've probably heard it before, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. You heard that before? Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Most biblical scholars believe they only counted the men, and they believe it was somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people that Jesus fed that day. He took a simple, uh, small amount of food, and he broke it, and a miracle happened, and everyone had plenty to eat. They actually had 12 baskets left over. When that miracle was done and Jesus was done performing that, his disciples and he want to leave the crowd and, and get rest or for whatever reason, they want to cross over a lake. The people were on this side. The lake is right here. They want to cross over and they want to go somewhere where the people aren't, maybe to get rest, maybe whatever. Uh, in the next verses, what we see right before the context of this saying in verses 16 through 24 is the famous story where Jesus walks on the water uh, when the storm hits the disciples in the middle of the lake. And then at verse 25, we start to see the context for what Jesus is saying because the people come to the other side of the lake. They find Jesus after he's fed them the day before, after he's walked on water during the night. And this is what they say. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, and, and I love the way Jesus goes straight to the issue. He doesn't, you know, make a lot of talk around it. He gets straight to the issue. 
He says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Before Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, he starts out this little sermonette with these people. He's trying to teach them something. And the first thing he does is he's like, you're wanting a physical meal. You're looking for the things of this world. And he essentially tells them, the world is empty though. It's empty. The food that the world has to offer will spoil. I was uh, in New York City one time. And I know we don't eat this down here in Crossville, but it's a big deal up in New York. Uh, I got me, one morning I woke up, and I got me a lox bagel. If you don't know what that is, a lox bagel is a bagel where they put cream cheese and whatever vegetables you want on it and smoked salmon. And it was really, really good. Well, I went up to my hotel room, and I was staying in a really, really bad hotel. No refrigerator, had to go buy a heater uh, at Kmart because there was no heat, and it was the middle of winter. I ate half of my lox bagel, left the other half sitting in my room, left out about 9 in the morning, got back at about 9 o'clock at night, and that lox bagel was sitting there, and guess what? I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because it was spoiled. Isn't it amazing how something that was so good just a little bit before eventually spoils? Jesus is telling the people, that's the stuff in this world. All the stuff that you're caught up in, the things that you pursue in this world, they eventually spoil and go bad. Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Listen to what he says. He says, we work to feed our appetites. Meanwhile, our souls go hungry. At the end of this passage, he says, all it amounts to anyway is smoke and spitting into the wind. Solomon backs up what Jesus is saying. He says, man, you, you work hard to get everything the world has to offer and all your wants and fill your appetite. And you know what it's like? It's like spitting in the wind. There's no point to it. Don't focus on the things that spoil. If I could give the young people in here a warning, listen to me. Right now, you can't help this. This is what you're thinking and, and your proclivity in your mind to do is, man, I'm going to be successful one day. I'm going to get the right degree. There's nothing wrong with this, by the way. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to get the right degrees. If I could just get this many followers on social media, if I could just get this level of popularity, if I could just be this good at sports, and I want to give you a warning today, if you're young in here, all that stuff is going to spoil. To my middle-aged people in here that are kind of in the stage of life that I'm in, you're in a stage right now where you're in the middle of killing yourself, working so hard, and you're waking up some days going, what's the point? Why am I doing this? Some of you guys, I've counseled you and I have these same feelings. You wake up some days and you go, I just want to run. I just want to run from my life. I thought having the, the right wife and the right kids and the right house and the right business and the right amount of money in the bank account was going to really lead me to being fulfilled. But what you're experiencing right now is what Jesus is saying. All that stuff, even though it's not necessarily evil, it spoils. The people in here that are closer to the end of your life than you are the beginning of your life, you may be looking at your life going, what did I do? Why did I waste all this time? You've got this hard reality. You understand what Jesus is saying because maybe you've had success in all those areas. Maybe you've gained everything and you've attained all your goals, but now you're sitting in a place where you're going, is that stuff even going to matter when I'm dead? Like what's the point and all the worry and all the stress and all the things that I missed and all the relationships I burned for these things in this world that spoil. Jesus is telling them in this scripture, when you pursue the things of this world, I want you to hear me, it will leave a hole inside of you. It cannot 
fulfill you and it will never satisfy you. Listen, a couple of examples that are just practical. Listen, when you kill the eight-point buck, the next time if you kill an eight-point buck, it's no big deal. you got to get the 12-point next time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen? Amen. Once you've been there and done that, you got to move on to something bigger and better. Once you, once you, uh, once you uh, get the right size house, amen, you, you finally get that 1,000 square foot house, you know what you're going to think? If I could just get 500 more square feet and I wouldn't kill my kids. And then you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a 1,500 square foot house and you know what's going to happen after that? If I could just have a 2,000 square foot house, then I'd be set. Nothing wrong with that. But do you see the emptiness in it and the way the things we pursue in this world, they spoil. They spoil. You think to yourself, if I can just make $50,000 a year, boy, me and my family would be set. But I'm here to tell you, once you make $50,000 a year, you want to know a secret? Then you're going to be thinking, if I could just make $75,000 a year, then I could afford the 2,000 square foot house that we need that's bigger. Oh, man, if I could just do that, then we'd get ahead. Then I'd be fulfilled. Then we would be happy. If I could just find a job, instead of just having two weeks vacation every year, if I could find a job where I had four weeks vacation every single year, then I could spend more time with my family. Then I would be happy. Then everything in my life could possibly come Together, I watched a a documentary on Netflix called American Meme. There's some language in it, but it's really interesting how the people that have everything this world nowadays and this culture have to offer, millions of followers, they're making millions of dollars, they're known throughout the world in this documentary in their deepest moments and their darkest moments. They're saying stuff like, people don't even know who I am. Surely, Surely, I got billions of followers. I make, I make, $150,000 for one post on Instagram. Surely there's more to life than what I'm doing right now. They're realizing what Jesus is trying to teach these people before he even makes this statement. I want to tell you something. You will never experience the fullness of Jesus until you admit to the emptiness of the world. Can I tell you that? As long as you still have some kind of thought process in your head where you think, if I can just get this, if I can just do this, if I can just have something the world has to offer, until you admit that those things are empty, you'll never experience the fullness of Jesus. I look around today and I see culture that's destroying us. Culture that's destroying Christians. And I see the idolatry of the things in our life that are of this world. The idolatry of business. The idolatry of your family. I mean, let's be honest. Some of y'all worship your family happiness and your kids. The idolatry of, of work. The idolatry of money. The idolatry of traveling. I don't know what it is. I've noticed, you know, being a pastor that some people so can't deal with their lives and they don't want to deal with them. So you know what you do? You travel as much as you can because you just got to get away. I don't even want to be in Crossville. I'm going to go whenever I can. I'm getting out of town. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Surely that will make it better if I go. And what Jesus is telling you today is, no, no, no. All that stuff spoils The only thing that will lead to fulfillment is Jesus. He tells us this when he continues, and they ask him a really obtuse question, kind of one of those awkward moments where the people ask Jesus something, and and you can sense the tension. They asked him after he says this, what must we do to do the works God requires? Same question we all ask, right? Right? Hey, Pastor Josh, just give me A, B, C, and D. What do I got to do to get into heaven? Let me know what I need to do to be right in the sight of God. And Jesus answers it, and he says, the work of God is this. Listen to this. Don't miss this. This is huge. I believe some chains are going to be broken this weekend for people that have a totally perverted view of what it takes in order to be saved. Jesus says, here's the work that God requires, to believe in the one he has sent you got to understand this, y'all. This was a scandalous saying that Jesus just said. 
Jesus saying this, this is the reason Jesus was murdered. Because he said stuff like this. Jesus is looking at a group of people that have been taught in order to be right with God, it's not about believing in him. It's not about believing in Jesus. No, 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 no. It's about over 600 Levitical laws that are found in the Old Testament. That's how you're right with God. You get circumcised. You, you don't eat these foods. You wear these kind of clothes. You practice these kind of rituals. You do this. And I say to you this weekend, you've been taught the same thing. There are people in here, under the sound of my voice, you think the way to be right with God is to be a good person? Just do the best you can? There's some kind of ritual you got to follow? Like you, you put on a suit on Sunday, here's your ritual. I got to wear this. I got to be here at a certain time. I got to do A, B, C. Like there's some kind of ritual you've got to follow. I got to get baptized in order to be right with God, in order for God to love me. I got to, hey, let's say this. I mean, this ain't smart for me to say, so you know I'm not working you. But as long as I go to church, church attendance that's what keeps me right in the sight of God. And that's what God requires of me. As long as I give 10% of my income, that's what makes me right with God. As long as I vote Republican, that's what keeps me right with God. As long as I stay out of jail, that's what keeps me right with God. As long as I don't drink, don't smoke, don't dip, don't have a girlfriend who does any of that stuff, that's what's going to keep me right with God. I'm here to tell you what Jesus is teaching us in this scripture is salvation. Salvation is not bought, salvation is not earned, and it is not somehow achieved by human effort. It is a free gift from God for those who believe in the one he sent, for those of us who believe in Jesus. Amen. Yeah, it's good. It's good. God's so good. It's so good. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Christ. Jesus. The scripture in this passage is so interesting because Jesus says this, and half of us clap, but if we're being real, some of us are sitting here going, surely that can't be it. You have the exact same reaction that these people had when Jesus said it to them. They can't wrap their minds around this grace thing. They don't understand what, what is he talking about. I don't get this. And so they continue, and they ask Jesus a question, and they say this, listen, Listen to the awkwardness of this. Jesus has told them, this is how you get to heaven. You believe in me. I'm God. I'm the man. I, I am the one. And this is what they say. What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Looking for something temporal. Looking for something physical. What will you do? Listen to this. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written... He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They reference a story from the book of Exodus. And this is what they're essentially saying to Jesus when he's offering them the free gift of grace. Hey, Jesus, we saw you feed 20 to 30,000 people yesterday. But listen, man, Moses, he fed millions of people for 40 years. So you're not quite stacking up to the Messiah that we thought was coming. You're not quite stacking up miracle-wise. Like when we put these things side by side, Moses is beating you. So, so you're going to have to show and prove to us with something a little bigger, a little better. We need to see some more miracles. We're going to need to see something more. And Jesus comes back and he said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us bread. Then Jesus declared, here it is, I am the bread of life. Everybody say that with me. One, two, three. I am the bread of life. And then he says something at the end of this statement that is huge. I wrote something about it in the first devotion we did last year. I say it at almost every evangelistic service we have, like Christmas and Easter. He says, whoever comes to me 
will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here are these people looking. I want you to catch this because this could be you. They're looking for something bigger than Jesus that's right in front of them. They're looking for a miracle to impress them when the Son of God, the Savior, is available to them. They're looking to be impressed by something temporal and something really just temporary when Jesus says, here's a free gift right now. I want to encourage you, don't look for something bigger. Isn't that how we're wired, y'all? Got to look for something bigger. Need to see a bigger miracle. Surely this, this discipleship of Jesus thing and this being fulfilled and being a Christian and following Jesus, surely there's more to this thing than just putting my trust in him. Surely we've got we've to do something extra. There's got to be something bigger. There's got to be more miracles than just Jesus, stop looking for a miracle and instead recognize the man who came to save you, Rev Church. Can I say that to you? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, that's for you, bro. Like, I didn't need to hear that. I'm good. I don't ever struggle with this stuff, but you do. You know what I mean? Like, that's for you. That's for you. Don't focus on the temporal. Don't focus on the temporary. The miracle that Moses was a part of was awesome. Forty years they ate. But forty years is not eternity. It's only forty years. Jesus is looking at these people and he's saying, Stop just thinking about the here and now and start to think about eternity. Stop just thinking about the meal that's in front of you right now and start thinking about the meals to come. Many of you guys came in here this weekend focused on the temporal, thinking about the now. The devil plays tricks, man. He knows how to still kill and destroy. He gets you to think about me, 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 now, 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 now. Not what's to come. Not eternity. Not, not the things that Jesus tells us to focus on. We get all wrapped up in what happened yesterday, our past, right now, the situation that we're in. And, and we, we struggle. And we give in a little. Because we're not thinking about eternity. It's that point at the altar call. When you know God's pursuing you. And he's calling you out. And he wants to know you. And you think to yourself, not this time. I just got to make it through. I've been here long enough to know how long Josh is going to go. If I can just make it about five more minutes. I don't want to embarrass myself in front of all these people right now. It's that point where you think, you're not thinking about the eternal. Well, we're living together. If we get married, we're going to lose our government assistance. We may lose our free insurance. We've got to think about the now. We can't think about what Jesus is telling us in the future. I know I'm, I'm all up in y'all's tater patch this weekend. Hey, man, y'all, like, come on, man. Everybody, you still with me? Make me feel good. Let's say, yeah, buddy, one, two, three. Yeah. You with me? Jesus is like, stop thinking. Temporary. Jesus didn't die to give you a temporary meal. He died to fill you up forever. Jesus didn't die so you could come to church and get an emotional high and then walk right back out in the world struggling with the same stuff, dealing with the same things. Jesus died to fill you up forever. 
Jesus didn't die so the church could have nice buildings and cool websites and all this stuff and then go out and pursue the stuff that spoils. Jesus died to fill us up forever. Listen, I've said this before. You can have everything the world has to offer. If you have that and you don't have Jesus, you don't have jack squat. But you can have nothing this world has to offer. And if you've got Jesus, you've got more than everything you need. Amen, Rev Church? We're going to get the lights. And, and uh, thanks, y'all. He's not a temporary meal. He's not a once a week meal. He's not a when I feel like it meal. Jesus is the meal. He didn't come to give us bread only. Jesus came to be bread for us, if that makes sense. I believe what Jesus said to uh, this crowd 2,000 years ago, we can totally relate to today. I believe there's people in here that if you're being honest, I mean, let, let's just lay our cards out on the table and be real, okay, for a minute. Like, if you're being honest, when I talk about and say things like you can walk with God and you can know Him personally, you have no clue. You know, man, what is it? <laughs> I've never known that. When I say stuff like, man, when you know Jesus... You recognize the emptiness of the world and you know he's all you need. You struggle daily with getting that next thing, that next thing, whatever that is. It doesn't even have to be a bad thing. Maybe it's drugs, but maybe it's a promotion. I don't know. And I just believe that there's people this weekend that if, if we're being honest, I'm not saying being churchy, okay, y'all? We're in the gym right now. We're hitting that last rep. Y'all with me? Say, I am, okay? Like, this is where, this is where the pain starts, but this is where the, uh, the, the results come. If you're being honest, you struggle with emptiness. Over Christmas break, uh, I cheated for like a week or two. Um, and uh, every day, it was something else. Like, I had my list of stuff that I was going to eat. Gained like 10 pounds over the holidays. Anybody with me? Amen. Like, bigger loop on my belt. Had to do it. And My favorite pizza right now at this moment is a mellow mushroom pizza. I don't know if y'all have ever eaten mellow mushroom. They're not paying me or endorsing me to say this, but uh, they should. If y'all are watching online, send me some coupons. But uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, somebody's going to be like, I knew he was all about the money. See? No, I'm just kidding. But. Uh, it's my favorite pizza, and so uh, we went out of town over to Knoxville uh, one, one night, and uh, we got two large cheese pizzas at the end of the day. And we'd already eaten that day, and so two large cheese, 16-inch pizzas for me, my wife, and my two kids. And so they eat like half a pizza, and there's like a whole pizza and almost a half of a pizza left. I don't know exactly how much it was, but all I know is I stuffed my face for like an hour to the point that I was like about to throw up, y'all. Like seriously, you know what I mean? I mean, it was glorious and it was awesome, you know, but, you know, it's still like I had to, I had to like sit up that night to sleep. That's how bad my stomach, I couldn't lay down. Like I'm sitting in the recliner and I'm like, I can't come to bed. If I lay down, I'm going to hurl everywhere. And, and I was just so stuffed and Woke up the next day. You know, it's one of those deals where you go to bed, but you wake up the next morning and you're still burping it up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, I know that's gross, but get over it, okay? Like, that's what was going on with me. And uh, I ate so much pizza, and uh, it was so good. But here was the thing that happened to me. Uh, about 2 in the afternoon the next day, to my surprise, I thought, man, I'm not going to eat anything the next day. I think it was on a Wednesday and Thursday. I was like, I'm not eating nothing. I'm going to fast today because... I had enough calories for the next week, you know what I mean? And uh, about 2 or 3 o'clock rolled around, and guess what? I was hungry. I was hungry. I ate all that pizza. I was still hungry less than 24 hours later. There's people in here, man. There's people. Listen to me. That's what you're doing in your life. 
That's symbolic of your life. You are uh, eating the things of this world and pursuing those things and munching down on some mellow mushrooms, so to speak. And you're thinking, this will work. This will work. I'll finally be happy. I'll finally have joy. I finally won't struggle. I'll finally get to a place where I'm not worried about what other people think. My marriage will finally be great if we just do this. My my job will finally work out if I can just get this done, if I can just do this. And you're finding it doesn't take long until you're hungry again. I want to tell you something, man. You will never know freedom until you know the person of freedom, and that is Jesus. You never know freedom. You never know freedom in your marriage. You'll never know freedom from drugs. You'll never know freedom from dead religion. You'll never know freedom from the worries of this world and the cares of this world until you, I didn't say you wouldn't struggle with that stuff after you know Jesus. I'm not saying that once you become a Christian, you're carefree and you don't ever worry about anything. We know that's not true. Amen, Rev Church. But the starting point for freedom in your life The starting point for freedom in your life is recognizing Jesus is the bread of life. Is recognizing, man, you can do all you want getting the stuff that spoils, but until you know Jesus, everything else is just an appetizer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I believe there's some people at Rep Church, and I'm not going to do this real long, uh, Already went just a hair over. Y'all good? Say amen. Amen. I believe there's people this weekend at Rev Church that just simply put, uh, over the last 35 minutes, you've recognized that you don't even know who Jesus is. You've never heard this kind of preaching before. You thought it was about going to church and not saying bad words. and All that stuff comes. That's part of it. I, I get it. Once you meet Jesus, though, is when it comes. And it's all done in vain if you don't know him. I believe there's people in here right now, maybe even watching online, that are empty. And I'm not even trying to, like, differentiate right now between people that maybe you said a prayer at one time and got baptized or maybe you've never said a prayer and ne- never put your trust in Jesus. I'm not, I'm not even going to try to differentiate that. I'm just talking about the people here this weekend that are empty. Just empty. And you know right now where you are. You need to be filled up. You want to know that you know that you know Jesus and you need to do business with him. You want to experience what he said when he said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. You'll never be thirsty. I'm going to say a prayer. and We'll all say this prayer together just like we've done the last couple of weeks. Every person in here, just repeat this prayer after me. I need your help if this prayer isn't for you to help lead other people into life-giving relationships with Jesus right now. Y'all with me? Say, I am. Let's all say this together. Lord Jesus, I am a broken mess. The things of this world will not fill me up. I'm so empty. I'm going to quit doing things my way. And I need your help to become the person you want me to be. I need rest, I need fulfillment, and right now I recognize I need Jesus. Be with me, help me, guide me, love me, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a hand this weekend, Rev Church, amen. Come on, man, come on, awesome stuff. We are so glad that you've joined us online today and checked out Revolution Church. You can find us on Facebook, 
and actually go like our page if you want to keep up with the church. Or you can join our text club, text Rev Church to 62582. If you have questions, if you'd like to talk to someone, if you have prayer requests, just email us at office at crossvillerevolution.com or you can call our church at 931-248-6441. Thank you so much. Thank you.